Hello, and welcome to the BSA Client Conversations. Um, we're coordinating this on a Zoom call. So Patricia from the BSA is helping um, me run this um, kind of ambitious idea of doing a conversation virtually. Um, so welcome to the BSA Client Conversations. I'm Carol Wedge, the CEO of Shepley Bullfinch, and I'm gonna be the host for this series. Um, so our vision is that client conversations will be held monthly on the second Tuesday of every month this time. Um, so you can put it on your calendar and we'll be focused on quarterly themes, spotlighting clients with their projects, their business models and their strategies for managing change. So we're starting the first quarter spotlighting climate change and resiliency. And we're very lucky that Chris Cook, chief of the environment for the city of Boston is our first guest. So before we go to Chris and our interesting conversation with him, and you'll have a chance to ask him questions. The format um, is gonna be that we start the program with some networking as if we were meeting in person. So everyone's gonna be assigned to a random breakout room just for 15 minutes and just introduce yourselves, kind of discuss and frame the potential questions you might have for today. Um, you know, why this is such a critical issue for you or why it's important where you are in your learning. Um, and then at um, 8.45, we're going to bring you back to the main room and we'll start our conversation with Chris. So I'm going to let Patricia take us off to the breakout rooms and we'll see you there. Welcome back, everyone. Um, before we begin, I'm going to share a few slides about housekeeping, but um, there's a chat. There's a chat that just came up about getting um, continuing education credit. But there's a slide here that just outlines the programs and sort of, you know, please mute until we're in Q&A. In Q&A, if you'd like to frame the question verbally, you can raise your hand, use that raise hand function, and I'll call on you. Um, and we are recording this session. So, you know, if there's someone in your background or um, you have a child working on um, virtual school with you, feel free to turn off your video if you don't want them to be part of the recording. Um, and again, in the chat, there is the form that you click um, for your continuing education credits. So, client conversations. Um, so we hope that you'll join us every month and we're gonna span a whole range of market sectors, providing insight into, you know, sort of how clients think about the world, how they think about selecting a design team, how they think about their strategy and business models. And so we've organized it into four large themes. I feel like we're starting with the one that's the most ambitious, complex, um, and, and one that we've been talking about for a long time and anxious to learn more from Chris about the city's plans. And we'll keep you updated. You can sign up for them on the BSA website, um, but it will be the second Tuesday of every month. So mark February 9th and March 9th on your calendar. So um, I have the great pleasure of introducing Chris Cook. I've met Chris several times. I've heard him speak through the Green Ribbon Commission and a number of different venues around the city. And we're gonna be talking today. So I'm gonna do a little bit of background. Some of you may know him well, others may meet, be meeting Chris for the first time. Um, but Chris has served as the Chief of Environment, Engine, Energy and Open Space for the city of Boston. And he's been in that role since 2018. And prior to that, he served as the Boston Parks Commissioner. So as Chief of the Environment, Chris is responsible for leading the city in achieving its climate adaptation and carbon neutrality goals. And we know these are bold goals. In addition, the cabinet, which is the Energy, Environment, and Open Space Cabinet, has a mission of enhancing the quality of life in Boston by protecting the air, the water, the climate, land resources, and preserving and improving the integrity of Boston's architectural and historic resources. A particular focus for Chris is the expanding of open space and access to Boston's most vulnerable residents. He's an ambitious person, he has an ambitious position, and to set the context, we've asked him to frame climate change and resilience for the city of Boston. So Chris, I'm gonna turn it over to you for about 15 minutes um, and let you share some of your thoughts and, and help kind of frame the context for this for our group today. Yeah, thank you very much, Carol. Uh, greatly appreciate it. And just a quick question, Carol, is this volume okay? Sounds good to me. All right, great. So thank you everyone for having me. And I'm incredibly grateful to the BSA for its partnership with the city of Boston and every one of our climate adaptation or carbon neutrality planning exercises. The BCA uh, is a partner, uh, the BSA, excuse me, is a partner with us. Um, you know, I think about projects like Carbon Free Boston, I think about projects uh, like the Climate Action Plan, and then I also think about projects like 
Mowgli Park. And whenever we need to enhance or create political will or create a sense of momentum around any of our plans, you as a profession are there and you as an organization there. So we're incredibly grateful. I also wanna start out with something that I think is really important um, that is from your, your homepage. And that's that the Boston Society for Architecture is a community committed to improving the quality of life for everyone through architecture and design. Architecture is for everyone. And of course, that is consistent um, with AIA's uh, national profile and mission statement as well. The reason I mention that is that I don't just see your organization and your professions, uh, whether you're architects or landscape architects or other members as um, partners in just the design element, but really partners in our community as far as social equity goes. And something that the pandemic has really taught us is that these fissures within our society are exacerbated by stressors. And some of those stressors we've seen is COVID-19. Other stressors include poverty. But one stressor that's been with us for a long time is systemic racism. And the fact that BSA is a partner in us in fighting for racial equity in Boston is greatly appreciated. If we're not careful, if we're not intentional about that work like you all are being, then we are gonna exacerbate the problems through the biggest fight crisis we're gonna face. And that of course is the climate crisis. So moving on, I'm gonna move on to the incredibly exciting uh, chart that shows Boston's carbon footprint, uh, leaving that subject for a second. And I really wanna focus on the fact that buildings in Boston are the driver of carbon emissions. So you'll see that this chart represents that roughly 70% of our emissions come from buildings and 50% of those carbon emissions come from our biggest buildings. And so it's very clear that if we have a carbon neutrality goal of 2050, and we do, as does the state, we really need to focus on buildings in the city of Boston. That doesn't mean that we have to um, abandon our transportation goals, because of course we wanna contribute to any ability to mode shift. We wanna contribute to any ability to further fund mass transit and electrify mass transit. But as many of you know, uh, that falls under the auspices of state control, DOT, and MBTA. So in that respect, we're really in an advocacy and an advising and a collaborative role. But things that we can actually take control of our own destiny in Boston is buildings, and we have to concentrate on that. So next slide, please. One of the aspects that we run into a lot, though, when we talk about decarbonizing buildings in the city of Boston and that Herculean task is what is the what are the utilities uh, doing? What is their role in this? You know, by far the cheapest energy source to hook up um, a home or business to today is natural gas. And of course, um, that's inconsistent long term um, with our with our with our goal of getting fossil fuels out of our energy mix. Well, I just want to make you aware of a large scale program that the city is adopting right now. This February, we are launching Community Choice Electricity, and that's a municipal aggregation program in the city that will encompass 220,000 or so Eversource customers. And what it does, it's gonna use the collective buying power of those customers to actually green the supply portion of people's electricity bills. So these are, these are organizations, these are nonprofits, these are smaller buildings that are ever source customers and they don't have their own power purchase agreement or their own special plan with the utility or they are residential customers. And we are actually gonna provide lower cost electricity to them while increasing the amount of renewables in their mix by 10%. So many of you may be familiar that the current renewable portfolio standard in Massachusetts is 18%. We'll be offering a default pro product that will be 28% and that will be cheaper than the Eversource basic service. In addition though, we are also gonna allow people to op up to 100% uh, renewable uh, product. And that will be a little bit more expensive, but for those who can afford it, we think that'll be valuable. Next slide, please. So understanding that we are taking action on the actual energy source of electrifying buildings, 
I think everyone on this call today understands the potential benefits of carbon neutral, neutral buildings. Obviously, COVID-19 has really highlighted the need for buildings, especially schools, especially senior homes to update the HVAC systems. And essentially that will result hopefully in cleaner and healthier buildings. We do think that the long term, there are energy cost savings to be made from these carbon neutral buildings. Obviously the more efficient a building is, the, the, the less energy it will use. And as renewables continue to get cheaper through clean energy investments at the state and federal level, we think that will result in savings. And then the, the real opportunity that we're excited about is, is there a possibility to actually link this emerging need, this need to retrofit buildings? In Boston alone, there's 86,000 buildings. Technically, every single one of those buildings would need to be retrofit in order for us to hit our carbon neutrality goal of 2050. Where is that workforce? If we create the right standards in place to create that job market, can we also connect people from socially vulnerable populations, the populations who are most likely to be adversely affected by climate change to this amazing job opportunity? And can we fund those job opportunities through federal, state, and city uh, policies? That's the real goal of a work that's ahead of us. Next slide, please. So here is a, is a few of the highlights from our Climate Action Plan of 2019. Again, very grateful to BSA for its collaboration on the Climate Action Plan. I want to highlight uh, the, the, the major groupings of this work. You know, it's around new buildings, it's around major renovations, it's around existing buildings. As we said, there's 86,000 buildings in Boston. In 2050, the year of our carbon neutrality goal, the floor space that's going to exist in 2050, 80% of it already built. So it really is about retrofits when you start talking about carbon neutrality goals. And then of course, there's the idea of the enabling strategies, those strategies that can help us achieve our different social equity goals as we move forward. Those are sort of the groupings, but I do wanna focus uh, very briefly on this idea of strengthening a green building zoning requirement to a zero net carbon standard in the city of Boston. If you could go to the next slide, please. Most people are familiar with the fact that uh, down the street on Commonwealth Ave, our colleagues over at Boston University who helped co-author the actual Carbon Free Boston Report, which provided the technical analysis that buoyed our 2019 Climate Action Plan, are building by far Boston's largest zero net carbon building the BU Data Sciences Building. It's gonna be a massive achievement when it's, uh, when it's finished, and it's gonna be powered mostly through geothermal aspects. Now, while geothermal isn't a good opportunity for all new buildings, we think that networked geothermal and geothermal on-site is a real opportunity that hasn't been fully explored here in the city of Boston moving forward. Next slide, please. And I also wanna highlight the leadership of the Boston Planning and Development Agency, as well as the Department of Neighborhood Development Green Building Programs. I mean, here you have architects like Scott Payette and Leopold Brown Gold, uh, Goldback. I'm sure, I'm sure I'm forgetting some others, but there are already zero net carbon buildings or E-positive buildings being built in the city of Boston today. Yes, there are incentives. Yes, there's some special zoning. Um, there's some opportunities, but what we're finding is that affordable housing can be built zero net carbon. So we can provide these healthier buildings and have them powered by renewable energy. As you know though, the, the, the interesting thing about this is this is new construction and also it's of a certain size. And so there is a scale problem as we start to talk about zero net carbon buildings. And there are building typologies that are just more complicated beyond just residential housing to power zero net carbon today. And so how are we gonna tackle those opportunities? Next slide, please. I also wanna focus on the idea of the retrofits and how difficult that work will be. It, will be not, it won't be enough for BSA to adopt it as something that's important to them and pass that on to the clients. The city of Boston is gonna to have to require people to change their buildings. And in some respects, that may be painful. So we're gonna to have to develop a carbon emissions performance standard to decarbonize existing large buildings in the city of Boston. 
that policy is being developed right now. And I'll talk a little more in depth about it, but just so you know that we're not alone. Washington DC and New York City already have a similar policy and there's as many as 10 other cities that are either adopting or about to adopt a carbon emissions performance standard within their city. Of course, there's different rules and regulations in all these cities and so it looks a little bit different. Next slide, please. No, so why are we doing this? Well, it's really, it's really clear as you saw from the first slide, if most of our buildings are actually contributing most of our carbon emissions. If we're serious about carbon neutrality, we have to retrofit these buildings. And so what's the opportunity there? Well, we think that if we provide a long-term horizon, we can actually allow people to fundamentally capitalize this work so they can use some of the energy savings to pay for it. That's what we do in the city of Boston. We hit our decarbonization goals in our municipal buildings by funding it long-term through capital capital opportunities. And we think private entities can do that too. That's why the city of Boston just passed the CPACE ramp program, which allows long-term energy savings to capitalize retrofit work in buildings and have those savings and have that loan actually stay with the property, even if the property changes hands, because it's part of an assessment betterment program. And so they actually get the advantage through a CPACE program to decarbonize a building just like the city does because it achieves those energy savings long-term over time. And also we're gonna provide a lot of flexibility through our program. We're gonna allow people to comply through an alternative compliance payment. And hopefully those payments would actually be used to decarbonize things like public housing or schools or other buildings that have a huge public benefit for socially vulnerable populations. But we're also gonna to have to have a lot of flexibility on the typology. Listen, everyone knows that a lab uses a lot more energy than just you know, a museum, which is often dark uh, most of the time. And we're gonna have to provide flexibility on the sizing in the populations within those buildings. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about um, a retrofit threshold policy, what is the size of the building we're talking about? Well, if you're not familiar with BIRDA, which is the city of Boston's energy disclosure ordinance, this will be basically BIRDO, but we're gonna expand it because again, we have to hit our carbon neutrality goals. BIRDO currently applies to buildings that are over 35,000 square feet or 35 units. We're gonna lower that to 20,000 uh, square feet. And that means we're gonna add 3,500 buildings to that program. Now, while the first buildings wouldn't have to be retrofit before 2026, we do think that gives folks a long runway to get used to the program, understand the different pathways to decarbonization, and also understand the metrics they're gonna have to, I apologize, that was my timer going off. I'm already running a little late. But also understand those metrics they're gonna have to hit in order to comply with this building emission standard ordinance. And so we think there's a lot of opportunity for your industry to help building owners navigate the different types of retrofits they'll have to make or the different types of energy conversions they'll have to make or the different types of efficiency measures they'll have to take and at which times they'll have to take those. So we're happy to answer any questions you might have about that ordinance. And if I could finish on the next slide. So why are we doing this? Many of you on this call are familiar with this plan. This is Mayor Walsh's vision for a resilient Boston Harbor. And it knits together almost 100 different other plans, largely designed by landscape architecture firms that are represented on this call. Plans as disparate as Piers Park, as uh, Moakley Park in South Boston, Langone Popolo Park in the North End. Resilient Boston Harbor is the idea that we can actually use our harbor and adapt it to protect us against sea level rise and provide huge recreational benefit of the city. But make no mistake, the reason we're doing it is we think there's opportunities to expand recreational space, but we're doing it because we're in a climate crisis, we're a coastal city, and we're vulnerable. If we don't take all of that action on buildings, we are not fulfilling our moral obligation to not continue to contribute to the problem that got us in this mess in the first place. It is carbon emissions that is leading to sea level rise. The reason we have to deal with 40 
inches of sea level rise in the city of Boston between 2050 and 2070 is because of carbon emissions. So as a global leader, we can't put forth a climate adaptation plan with all of these great benefits to expand open space if we're not also doing the right thing on carbon emissions. And so these plans have to work collectively together. And just as we wanna put people to work in retrofitting buildings, this is also the big opportunity in the city of Boston because not just about expanding green space along the harbor, it's about expanding green space inland, about dealing with urban heat island, about expanding our tree canopy for our urban forest master plan that we're developing, about the future stormwater management because we're gonna be having higher precipitation events here in the city of Boston. We have to get ahead of the climate crisis because it's already arrived on its shores. And with that, I just wanna end with thanking you for the opportunity to be here today and I'll turn it back to Carol. Terrific, thank you, Chris. That was a great um, blitz of <laughs> incredibly complicated material. Um, and we're excited to have a conversation with you. So for folks, we're gonna go till, um, we can go as long as 9.45, depending on your questions. Chris and I are gonna just talk about for about 15 minutes, hopefully stir the pot on your thoughts and ideas, um, and then we'll um, take questions from the audience. So what's new in the last couple of weeks, Chris, is also something I want you to talk about. It's a big optimistic change with the mayor going to Washington, a Biden administration that has bold environmental goals. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Um, and, and sort of your perspective, Gina McCarthy, um, you know, playing a, a central role in climate, building a climate team. Um, can you just frame, you know, sort of how that feels and what your perspective is? Yeah, I'd love to. It's hard for me to talk about it and not just actually explode out of my seat with excitement, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so this is, this is literally the, the dream team, right? I mean, you have someone who understands the opportunity and the risk of climate change acutely, perhaps more than any other individual in the United States, Gina McCarthy, someone who is a fighter, someone who is a nuts and bolts operator, understands large scale bureaucracies and how to affect change within them. And then she's getting a partner who has led 450 mayors on the fight for climate change, has been a steering committee of C40, arguably the most important global climate action network of cities. And oh, by the way, he is now the top labor official for the free world, while also being a building trades uh, union uh, leader, as well as a member. And so this is what we've always dreamed of, right? We've always dreamed of placing the labor movement at the heart of the opportunities and challenges of climate change because these are the good green jobs we've been talking about. Yes, it's gonna require major federal investment, but it's also gonna require incentives. It's gonna require flexibility for businesses so that they can also invest in these jobs. And it's gonna require nuance and boutique and bespoke approaches in different, different um, areas of the country. You know, so how can you actually convert uh, energy development and work such as pipe fitters, you know, away from fossil fuels and get them into clean steam, get them into geothermal, get them into other activities. You know, th there's, there's nothing but opportunity ahead of us. Um, the old way is not going to work, though. You know, there was, a, there was a very siloed approach, as many of you aware, to uh, past federal stimulus programs. You know, and it's, you would go through the existing DOE grants, it would go through, you know, the existing Tiger transportation grants. I think the real um, opportunity of the Biden administration is how brilliantly the president is embedding climate into every single cabinet because the climate crisis requires, um, you know, I won't say cohesive because that's, that's too aspirational a word, <laughs> but it, it, it requires coordinated and it requires systemic approaches because the problem is that vast and that complicated. In that way, it's very similar to racial equality. Yeah, really interesting. So um, maybe just to go back to Boston along that thread, can you talk a little bit about, you know, these are big commitments from 20 to 2050. 
How do you think about implementation? How do you think, you know, so one phrase is like boiling the ocean, right? But how do you break it down so that you start to create a plan both for your cabinet and your teams and all of the agencies that you coordinate? Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, how you think that implementation will go and how architects and designers and landscape architects and engineers can be partners and, and helpful in that process? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think the field, I mean, I think the trend is going to continue of teams being formed as opposed to different siloed work on jobs, right? And so, you know, already you, you work uh, cohesively and comprehensive with a team of engineers and a team of architects and a team of LAs on projects. And eventually it just becomes the work, right? So waterfront parks are no longer, you know, recreational spaces where the biggest decision you have is, are we going to do artificial turf or are we going to do natural grass, right? Now it's about, okay, where's the, uh, you know, the stormwater management storage underneath that artificial turf field? How large is the berm? Are we blocking the public's access from the waterfront by that berm? What are the ADA requirements here? What are, the, what are the signals we are sending to make sure that we are welcoming to people of all um, backgrounds in this park? You know, and so you actually have to take a, if the project is big enough, you have to take a comprehensive team approach to the work. As far as how we start to wrap our heads around the adaptation neutrality goals in the city of Boston, we take the same approach. It's the work. You know, we no longer have climate goals that are embedded in the environment department. We have climate goals that are embedded in the city. So Chris Osgood, the chief of streets, understands my climate goals and I understand his transportation goals. Neither one is more important. We have to work together to actually achieve them. Once we started de-siloing city government and actually just focusing on the work, something that you've all been doing for years by designing, that's what you do. You work with people from different backgrounds and different expertises, and you put together the show like Mickey Rooney, right? That's what city government is starting to do. It's just approaching the work. So the work is adaptation, the work is neutrality. But I also don't wanna de-emphasize the fact that at least on emissions, you gotta focus where the biggest emissions are. And that's why we're going after large buildings and that's why they have to be retrofit or else we're not going to hit our neutrality goals. And by the way, our most socially vulnerable populations typically work in those buildings. And so we want to make healthier, cleaner buildings for them and create opportunity by decarbonizing those buildings. Well, and the comment I hear again and again from architects is we actually know how to do those. So we'll have the BU building as a case study later in the series. And we'll hear a little bit of a client conversation of how BU wrap their head around their ambitious goals. I think there's something in between, and I'm interested in how building owners are responding to this vision, because <clears throat> I think teams are great once an owner or a client has this vision. But if the client or the owner is at the end, back in the parade, <laughs> not yet focused or, or feeling knowledgeable about these goals, um, you know, I think, can you talk a little bit about what you're hearing from building owners, what questions they're asking? And I think that's an incredible opportunity, not just for the labor force, of the construction industry, but the labor force of the AEC as a whole um, to really understand how those clients are thinking. So if you could talk a little bit about that, that would be great. I can, and it's about education and outreach. Listen, there's a lot of concern, right? You have a lot of unsigned leases right now in buildings. You have a lot of nervousness about what is the type of use that my building is actually gonna be filled with after the COVID-19 pandemic. And now you're layering in the fact that the city and the state are actually thinking about requiring me to make changes to my building, changes that I don't fully understand. When you're talking about buildings over 35,000 square feet, you're typically talking about a pretty sophisticated property management team that probably manages a portfolio that can navigate city hall bureaucracies and understand policies. You start getting below 35,000 square feet where we have to go, and some of these buildings, you're talking about, there's the person with the keys. That's the property manager. And now all of a sudden, they're having to interact with building retrofits and energy use and type, you know, typologies and compliance with the city ordinance. 
that's where the city has to do education and outreach. And it has to do it in every corner of the city. And we're going to need the technical expertise of your members to do those kinds of, you know, not only to bring the technical expertise, but to bring it down to layman's terms and get people comfortable with this work. That's great. That's great. And so before we go to questions from the audience, I just want to kind of maybe change directions and just ask you, can you talk a little bit about you, your career personally? Like what brought you to this work? You're such a passionate um, advocate for it. You're, you know, you're a client, you're a policymaker, you're an advocate. But like, how did Chris Cook come to this role? And can you talk a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be very brief, but it's crazy. Um, I, I went to UMass uh, to become an actor. I came back to Boston. I started in theater. Uh, I did theater at night and I worked at the Boston Public Schools uh, touring educational theater programs during the day. I then went to go work for Boston Public Schools in their arts office. I designed the arts curriculum um, standards for the city of Boston. I was then moved over by Mayor Menino over to the arts office at the city of Boston. I worked for Mayor Menino and I uh, eventually got promoted to arts, tourism and special events. So I used to look at parks as concert venues, and I used to figure <laughs> how many people I could get into every square foot of Boston Common and the Rose Kennedy Greenway and activation. And bringing diverse audiences was really my passion. And so I absolutely loved parks and that element. I used to program the Strand Theater in Dorchester. It's a 1400 seat theater. Um, so when Martin J. Walsh became mayor, I had the opportunity to go over to parks. I thought I would just go and activate those spaces, but I fell in love with Olmsted. And I fell in love with this idea that he brought democracy. He democratized cities by creating these open spaces where it didn't matter if you were black or white or if you were rich or poor, that open space was for you. And then I saw that even in our city where we've accomplished 100% of our residents live in, within a 10 minute walk of a city park, I realized that there's still large inequities in our city as far as the quality of open space and people's access to it. So I fell head over heels in love with the landscape architecture field. And after that, I became the chief of environment, energy and open space. And now I'm, love, I'm in loving getting our city to carbon neutrality while also building great parks. So that's me. That's very exciting. And it also weaves together, um, I would say similar paths for a lot of architects and landscape architects of starting off in a creative venue and sort of starting to see those those opportunities. So it's exciting to both program, you know, think about the future of the parks and the 47 miles of, of harbor um, that can be activated in a different way, but also serve this really ambitious climate resiliency goal. Everything um, I know, everything I know in this world comes from theater. You know, you show up at your first read through and you don't know anyone in that room, but guess what, that's your team. And in a few weeks, you're gonna be putting on a play. You all build buildings, you all build projects, and it's the exact same thing. You walk in and you start working together to achieve the goal. That's what we all have to do on these goals. That's great, that's great. Um, I'm gonna go to the chat, and so I encourage people to put questions in the chat. Um, I have one from our breakout session and one that just came in. The first one is, can you talk a little more about networked geothermal? Um, and just break that down a little bit for us. Yeah, so right now, both um, National Grid and Eversource are funding geo network geothermal pilots. Now, we're not sure they're necessarily going to be in the city of Boston, but this is the idea of, yes, the BU Data Sciences Building is big enough. It has enough real estate. It controls enough property on site that it can, it can actually dig into the center of the earth empower its building, right? I mean, I think it's like 2,200 feet. It's like two or three uh, blue hills stacked on top of each other actually going to the ground. It's an incredible project and we're very proud of it in the city. But not every building is going to be able to do that. And certainly uh, building developments that require different typologies within a certain footprint or different ownership is going to be able to do that. So network geothermal is the idea that we could actually build geothermal fields within our city and create um, the piping system to deliver that energy to a group of buildings that may be very different in their energy use program. Now that would have to be managed, but there's huge benefits, there's huge efficiencies there. And then the real benefit there is then you start talking about a clean conversion, not only of the energy, but of those jobs. It's the same work when you're talking yeah. about natural yeah. gas. So that's the real opportunity we see. 
Yeah, we were laughing together. I, since talking to you in more depth, I kept thinking, how do we deliver electricity to every home in the United States? How do we deliver fiber? How do we deliver sewer? These are similar scale ambitions. Um, and so there may be, you know, both lessons in history, but also might break down the intimidation of how do you change a whole city? Because it's been done before, maybe perhaps just not on our watch. And this is where um, cities have to really lead, right? Because you start looking at city properties and that energy being distributed. I don't think there's enough private property to actually create network geothermal. I think you have to look at things like streets, parks. What are the opportunities? Could there be a geothermal field underneath an artificial playing surface like there is at some universities in the United States. Right, right. And any park can serve that function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great, that's great. Um, there's a question also maybe linking back to these investments in resiliency and sustainability. Can you connect it back, not just to social justice, but also public health? Sure, I mean, it's very clear on the adaptations, right? right? And COVID-19 has really highlighted that, you know, investments, in equitable, accessible, and culturally relevant open space is really, really critical to our social behavioral health, um, but also our physical health. I mean, this is what Olmsted understood intuitively before there was even a firm of landscape architecture, right? That, that these are truly the lungs of the city, that we need this access to open space, especially in a dense urban environment. And then, of course, there's the huge health benefits of cleaner water through stormwater management, phosphorus removal through trees, all of those other elements. But then I think what we've really seen through COVID-19 is the fact that clean energy buildings are healthier buildings because they are, by definition, probably hooked up to a very elaborate, extensive HVAC system in order to get the best use out of the efficiency of those buildings. And so that's the idea of like, can we start filtering this air? And if we're gonna be dealing with uh, more respiratory diseases, how can we limit asthma rates? And how can we really make sure that clean buildings and the benefits of them are being extended to our most vulnerable populations? You know, talking about one of your earlier questions, Carol, that's one of the challenges ahead of us. You know, it's decarbonizing some of Boston's housing stock, those traditional three-deckers in Roxbury, Codman Square, Grove Hall, um, some of our public housing buildings, where it doesn't have elaborate HVAC systems. How can we extend this opportunity to that housing stock? Right, absolutely. And how can we also develop funding mechanisms that are, again, interwoven in the system so we're not treating those, you know, three-deckers or independently small-owned units as their own problem and not segregate them. So, you know, I think they can learn from big buildings, but I think there's also a great opportunity for architects and landscape architects and engineers to kind of break down some case studies there. So you showed some great ones. I can imagine a role for the um, climate um, committee for the BSA of just showcasing and again, part being a participant in the education and breaking it down for what are future clients, but also just educating the community. Um, there's a different question. Uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, Carol, sorry, did you raise your hand? I didn't see. I guess I was also wondering just in terms of building, um, you know, the, the argument for this. I feel like the still the concept of tons of carbon or greenhouse gas feels so abstract. And I wonder if framing that in terms of life expectancy, you know, years of what, like if we can really oh. incorporate that public health metric into the way that we're framing those conversations. I mean, I think especially now that we've, unfortunately, in some ways, but perhaps we can leverage the education we've all gotten in, in terms of thinking about health disparities and public health in, in the COVID crisis to making, really incorporating that into this dialogue. So it's, it's really about people. Um, and also framed in a way that people can understand, right? Yeah. So that you could, you know, I always think of that framework of explain it to a fourth grader. If you can explain it to a fourth grader, you'll get most people. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting question. Just for the audience, if you want to frame your question like um, Caroline just did, please just raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, I have a bunch of questions in chat as well. But Caroline, it's great to see you and thanks for asking that really important question and also kind of recommendation of how we begin to unpack that. Um, the, there's a question about how 
members of this call or the BSA can get more involved? And is the timeline aggressive enough, Chris? Do you feel like it's aggressive enough or it's as aggressive enough as it can be today? But can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, if you talk to some members of the real estate and development community, they would say that it's far too aggressive, right? Um, <laughs> but what I would say is that our goals, we have a huge benefit in Boston. And I really have to thank the Green Ribbon Commission, as well as Boston University. Our goals aren't based on, you know, just getting in a room and trying to target 2050. They're based on, and I apologize to my zero waste colleagues, because this is the actual printed copy, which I should never have, but this printed copy of the carbon-free Boston, this is a technical analysis of Boston's emissions. And so our goals are associated with that technical analysis, where we have to be by what year. So are they aggressive enough? Yes, but if we don't implement them, in the timeline that we've laid out, will we hit our neutrality goals? No, we will not. And so there's a real accountability here to hold city leaders accountable for hitting those goals. And there's gonna be some pinch points. One of those we're gonna be running into is the issue before us. If the governor signs the bill saying that there's going to be uh, you know, a zero net building code that of course the city of Boston would adopt, you know, what does the Boston Planning and Development Agency do with its zero net carbon initiative that it's developing right now? Again, we don't want to create layers of bureaucratic, bureaucratic red tape. And yet, we still have to make sure that no new buildings are digging us deeper into this emissions hole. So that's going to be a big decision point the city faces if that bill actually gets passed. Well, and I think that's another opportunity. Someone's asking, how can we get more involved? We can get more involved by understanding the goals. We can get more involved by being the architects or landscape architects or engineers on the front line of a building that may not have an energy goal and how critical it is to use that as an education point, both for your client and linking it back to the city. Um, so something I've heard you say a lot is ask us for help. Um, I just want you to be able to create that pitch for how do people engage with the city, ask for help, learn more? What's your vision of creating the connections between all these different groups working on these important issues? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think there's a lot, large widespread political support in Boston for climate goals. I will agree strongly with Caroline that it's not about carbon emissions though, right? The thing that's gonna resonate, in fact, you'll hear it in the mayor's state of the city speech, speech tonight, which is most likely, as long as hopefully he gets confirmed, his last state of the city speech tonight. You know, climate isn't about um, different metrics and, and pie charts. It's about people. That's what climate change is about. And it is complicated to get some people to fully understand why they have to pay a little bit more potentially for renewable energy and what's the benefit to that. Why they may have to skip over the natural gas conversion from oval from oil and go straight to electricity. That's an opportunity, I think, through uh, community meetings. Listen, there's a neighborhood association in every corner of the city partnering with the environment department, you could have different members of the BSA climate committee explaining those benefits. And it's not just the wonky person from city hall that's explaining it, but it's another neighbor in your community using no other terms to explain why this work is important. This is complicated stuff. And, you know, I don't know if it's four year old, but you know, maybe it's eighth grade or 10th grade. You know, I don't know if you can get it down to four year old, but at the end of the day, even four-year-olds know that you have to do the right thing by their classmates. You have to do the right thing for the people in their life. It's about people. The more we make it about people, the more accessible this work will be. That's great. That's a great framework. And um, encourage people to watch the State of the City because I think understanding, you know, one of the things I see is that um, sometimes we're looking for an assignment as an architect, like what's my assignment? What's my RFP? And it's not as clear as that. And so I'd be encouraging people to get involved in all of these community groups, get involved with the city, 
participate because then it's going to lead you to the opportunities. But again, they're going to be different and they're going to be framed a little bit differently um, and more about learning about the opportunities there. So there'll be a huge amount of opportunities on kind of, I'll say the traditional way projects are released or framed or clarity around who the owner is. But I think in the next couple of years, there'll be a lot of advocacy work of getting people to walk ac work across those boundaries. And the more people in, on this call and in the BSA are involved in those, the more opportunities they're going to see. Um, I have another, another sort of angle on that. Um, can you talk a little bit, just a bit about transit um, and the two other themes I want to touch on before we end are transit and public schools. So can you talk about the sort of thinking about, you know, maybe it's the other 30%, but um, I'm just struck by how different transit patterns are in the last year. We never thought COVID would be a year in our lives. We're coming up on that pretty rapidly. Can you just think, talk a little bit about how you see opportunities there around zoning around transit and partnering um, with the state and all the different agencies responsible for transit? Sure. So, you know, first off, this is not a time to stop investing in mass transit, right? This is not a time to invest in single car infrastructure. Yes, do we want every car in the city of Boston to be an EV? Of course we do. But more exciting would be an electrified rail system that brought people into our city and out of our city every day to support our economy. And as you start to look at the potential zoning flexibilities that people at the levels of state government are talking about, about creating transit oriented development, about creating electrified rail systems that could actually come into the city. That's where we think the real opportunity is to grow the economy and reduce emissions in the city of Boston. And the more of the streetscape that we can actually give back to the public, because don't forget that street is supposed to be public realm. We forget that because it feels very privatized because there's single cars on it all the time. The more of that public realm we can give back to the public, there are huge uh, social equity benefits to that and there's huge health benefits to that. We'll be a healthier, cleaner city, we can do that. So I've been very proud of our colleagues at the transportation department of, it, it, it's the wrong word to say to take advantage of the traffic patterns of the pandemic, because of course no one ever wanted to be in this situation. But when you start to see the expansion of the bike, bike network in the city of Boston, a, a, a city that is enormously complicated um, as far as our, our streetscape, but let's face facts, we're not more complicated than Paris, Amsterdam, Copenhagen. The last time I was in all of those cities, they had a lot of windy streets too, all right? And so a lot of their streets are very old as well. We can figure it out, but we have to give up some of that public realm. That's great, that's great. Um, can you talk a little bit about, there's a comment about this needs to be integrated into the um, Build Boston Public Schools Master Plan or how it applies to public schools and, and, and sort of the approach that you see there. Great, so um, there's three major intersections that are really important. One, on new buildings. Um, so some of you may be familiar, but all new municipal buildings in the city of Boston have to be zero net carbon or zero net carbon ready, which basically means they have to have an electrified system and we will eventually hook them up to completely 100% renewable electricity, right? And so that applies to Boston public school buildings and that's very exciting, especially as you start to look at new building as, like uh, the Boston Arts Academy. The other real opportunity is the Renew Boston Trust Program. As you start to look at Renew Boston Trust, that is the actual mechanism we use to decarbonize our existing buildings today. So we have authorized, uh, I think it's roughly about $9 million in this upcoming fiscal year. I don't have the total number of school buildings we'll be working in, but those will be retrofit measures, those will be energy efficiency members. And then the real opportunity we have is you look at the vast expanse and opportunity for solar on Boston Public Schools, like between green roofs and solar, we could achieve a lot of our different climate goals by just the real estate that we have in these BPS schools. And so using Renew Boston Trust, using Community Choice Electricity to fund those programs, those are some of the different opportunities. Now, of course, we don't wanna build anything on site unless we're educating the kids about you know, what we're building on site. So we also have to figure out a way to make sure that this is incorporated into the curriculum. Um, a couple more questions, and um, we have just 10 more minutes for folks and for Chris, who has a busy day. But um, 
particularly is there a retrofit project that's achieved the zero net carbon that you think of whatever scale and uh, i'm thinking of one maybe you know sort of the retrofit of the hancock um, by boston properties but is there a, is there a boston retrofit project that have achieved zero net carbon yeah no it's a great question um i will provide i'll provide a, i'll have to provide a list after it it, it doesn't okay. come to mind i will say the 200 clarendon project i think you're talking about that achieved massive um efficiencies it is not carbon neutral it's okay. not and it's a challenging building and, and that's one of the buildings that you're actually when we're creating this ordinance we don't want to punish early adopters that's one of the challenges we're going to have you know because if you're if you're tra having to hit efficiency goals by a certain year well you have to make room for the people who already did this work because it was the right thing to do and obviously boston properties is one of those companies that's really forward leaning on climate goals um 200 clarendon's a very good example of that so so how do you deal with those buildings that have already done you know i'm not going to say easy work because trust me it was not easy in that building and it was very expensive but they've already done that efficiency work. Now, how are they going to achieve the rest of it? Great. Um, I think there's a couple questions that may maybe lead to like a follow-up conversation with Allison from your office and sort of more granular walking through the requirements of big buildings, how quickly they'll be required. I think that could be a whole education session that we work on jointly with your office and BSA. Um, but just to kind of end um, our conversation, can you just talk a little bit about, you know, sort of what keeps you energized, your philosophy, you know, how do you continue to um, hold this torch? And what are some of the suggestions you have for people that occasionally get a little bit demoralized that it's going to take a long time, you know, it's a constant education, you know, I guess I'm encouraging you to be the motivational actor <laughs> of like how you stay energized about this and how you stay focused on it. I mean you're the ones who are going to reap all the rewards so you should be very energized about this i mean this is the work you know forget about new buildings and new projects when you start talking about the fact that you have to retrofit existing buildings architecture and then landscape architecture as you start to look at the fact that buildings are going to have to take in into account new boston water and sewer requirements that are going to evolve through you know the fact that we have to deal you know we we haven't thought about water cohesively in the city of Boston for a long time, right? We've had the benefit of the quabbin and we turn on the tap and it just happens. All of those problems that the rest of the country is dealing with with water, we're going to have to start dealing with in a very real way. You know, in some ways, I actually think that water and sewer and the MWRA have done too good of a job because we take the resource for granted. But you start looking at stormwater management, heat island effect, and the way cohesively developments are going to have to deal with those fields, especially as they start to retrofit buildings. The thing that would motivate me is, is the work. This is the opportunity. And anyone that's not focused on zero net carbon work is going to get left behind. Great. That's a great way to end. And we just want to thank you so much for taking the time to prepare and, and think about sharing these really important goals with us. Um, your ambition is infectious. So um, we want to thank you for sharing your vision and um, spending time with us and being such a willing partner to continue to educate folks on how the city is thinking and, and how we can help all of the residents of the city really mobilize on make, creating this change. Um, so just thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And for our attendees, you'll see the slide that will have future conversations. Um, the next conversation was with John Meservi, who has led a lot of ambitious projects for formerly partners, but now Mass General Brigham. Um, and we'll be talking to him about how they've put together their framework and vision um, for all of the buildings that they oversee. So Chris, a huge round of applause. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, and then Carol, the only other thing I would ask you is if you could just send out my email afterwards in case someone had a question that I didn't get to. Yes, we'll send out the email and it's recorded and um, Pat Patricia and I will follow up, but I think we could also send out the slides for folks. So thank you. Um, a promise to our audience, we'll work on a follow up where we get a little more into the weeds on your questions about what the city is going to require by when and how they report and Birdo and um, some of the things that people have been exposed to, but clearly we need to do a lot of um, more education for the BSA members as well. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Take care.